Welcome to worship and happy Father's Day to all of the fathers out there. We are so glad that you logged on to worship today and pray that this will be a, a meaningful time for you as well as for, as for us. Um, as always, you can find a copy of the church's bulletin on the website. So I encourage you to uh, Google uh, Center Presbyterian Church on, uh, yeah, on Google and uh, you should be able to find the website and, and the church bulletin is, is listed there. And uh, we, we would love to get to know you better. Uh, so if you're not a regular member or, or a regular attendee here, we encourage you to reach out to us so uh, we can get to know who you are and see what we can do to support you and care for you. Uh, so I have several announcements for you all before we, we move on with worship. Um, the session met just this past week, and uh, we made the decision to... Uh, to sort of do a hybrid worship the, the rest of the summer. Uh, so uh, the remaining Sundays in June, which I believe is just one more, uh, we're going to continue to be worshiping outside on Sunday mornings at, at 1030. Um, but then uh, in July and August, uh, we're going to sort of do a half in, half out worship service uh, in that the first two weeks of each month, week one and two, uh, we're going to be in, worshiping inside. And then uh, we, Sundays 3 and 4 in both July and August, we will be worshiping outside. Uh, and then since August happens to be a five-Sunday month, we'll also be inside for that. Uh, so that's the plan. Uh, we, we hope uh, that you'll, you'll come. And, uh, and, and when we're outside, just a, re a reminder to you that uh, everyone will need to bring a chair or you know something comfortable to sit on, like a blanket or something. Um, Next Saturday, that's the, 20, the 26th, uh, there's a special mission brunch happening. It's in support of God's Precious Children. It's the organization that uh, my wife is the president of, uh, and, and I'm on the board. Um, and it's a, a, a group that works to educate kids in, in Liberia. These are kids who are uh, particularly poor uh, and whose opportunities for a meaningful education are, are um, much more difficult to come by than, than for us. So uh, on the 26th from 10 to 12, uh, we'll, we'll start 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We'll start with a brunch. Uh, then there will be a presentation where we'll tell you about Liberia, tell you about education there, and, and what our organization has, has done uh, to help the, um, some of the children of Liberia. Um, and then afterwards, there will be some Liberian games that kids can play. Uh, there will be, uh, and, and other ways that you could support our, our organization we have some God's Precious Children swag um, that you could buy. There's uh, some Liberian, uh, some items from Liberia that you could um, put a bid on for silent auction. Um, and you could write a letter to some of our kids to encourage them uh, to, you know, persevere in their education even when things get tough. Uh, or you could sponsor one of our students. Uh, so it's going to be a really fun morning. It's very family friendly. We encourage you to come. We encourage you to bring your kids or, um, you know, invite a neighbor. And um, so a couple other announcements. Yet PW, PWA is having their meeting on, I believe it's Tuesday the 22nd at 7 p.m., they're going to be continuing their, their study of, of women of the Bible. And uh, very exciting announcements for those of you who have placed a order for some youth ice cream for the fundraiser. You get to pick that up this upcoming Sunday, the 27th. Uh, so if you forgot to pay, don't forget to 
bring your check or money with you to, to cover that, and, and uh, you'll get to be enjoying some good ice cream next week. And, and I believe they're still looking for some people to help um, make the ice cream. So if you're free, uh, I think it's Thursday, or Friday, Saturday, something like that, uh, reach out to, to some of the people who are in charge of that, and, and I know they'd love to have some extra hands. Um, Camp Chrysalin is also open. Uh, we are having a, a Camp Chrysalin actually come here to the church July 26th through the 30th. And for kids in grades one through six, they are welcome to, um, to join us. It's going to be from 8.30 to 4 each of those days. Um, so just a, a day camp. Um, and it's just going to be a really fun week of group games. And, um, and we'll be digging into the Bible together. And there will be crafts. And, uh, and yeah, it, it's just going to be a really, really good week. Um, and uh, the, the whole week is only, uh, I believe, $40 for, uh, for each student. Uh, and we do have scholarships available if money it truly is a hardship for your family. Um, but the registration closes uh, early July, I believe it's the 7th. Um, so uh, talk with your family about this, and, and we encourage you to, um, to register your, your child or grandchild soon. So that's all the announcements we have this morning. Let us turn to the Lord in worship. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the peoples. Let us worship God. So I invite you to join us in singing our first hymn, When, when Morning Gilds the Skies. You can find the words printed in the, uh, the bulletin online. Friends, we are all faced with the fact that each of us are people who have made mistakes in life and people who have acted selfishly and, and people who um, practice their faith sort of half-heartedly. So let us confess the ways that we have sinned to the Lord so that we can be forgiven and be made new. So pray with me this morning. God of glory, we confess that we have not sought your face. We ignore the needs of the poor and turn away from our own kin. We allow the gospel to go stale and hide the light you have given. Forgive us. Give us grace. 
by the renewing gifts of your spirit, inspire and empower us again to show the wonder of your love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Let us be salt and light to each other by sharing the love of God um, and God's grace with one another. Um, so may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. If you're um, watching at home with anyone, I encourage you to share peace with them. Uh, otherwise, I encourage you to share a sign of peace or a message or greeting of peace with a sister or brother in Christ later today. So will you now pray with me, friends? O oh Lord, we are lamps, but you are the light. May your spirit come and light up our hearts, that we may bear this light into the world. Amen. For our first scripture readings, I'm going to be reading from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, and later Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Listen for a word from the Lord. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And now from Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the, mountain, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the, to the end of the age. And now for our second reading, we're going to be picking up where we left off last week. Uh, you, you may recall that uh, we started a sermon series that we're calling Summer School with Jesus. We're going to be working our way through the Sermon on the Mount together, which is Jesus' first set of teachings in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, so here, listen to what Jesus has to say in Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. Of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after, hiding a lamp, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. His ship is down and damaged potentially beyond repair. He's stranded on an unknown planet. You can see the space ranger taking in his surroundings. Never before has he seen such a habitat with such unusual life forms. And, uh, and having just met the sheriff and being assured that these odd-looking creatures indeed are not threatening, he bravely chooses to engage with them. Honestly, anyone who knew him would expect nothing less from this elite space ranger. Then the pink one speaks to him. The ranger can tell that he's an animal of sorts, but is much bigger and rounder than any he had seen before. He's got a little slit in his back, too, and, and when he walks, he kind of makes a little jingling sound. This pink monstrosity says to the ranger, where are you from? Singapore? Hong Kong? The space ranger replies, I'm stationed in the Gamma Quadrant of Section 4 as a member of the Elite Universe, Universe Protection Unit of the Space Ranger Corps. I protect the galaxy of the threat of the invasion of the evil Emperor Zerg, sworn enemy of the Galactic Alliance. 
Oh, really? I'm from, I'm from play school, and I'm from Mattel, said the talking Mr. Potato Head and the green plastic dinosaur, respectively. And so, with this dialogue, the world was introduced to Buzz Lightyear, the space ranger from the, the, the toy movie called Toy Story. If you've ever seen this, if you've never seen this movie before, uh, please know it comes highly recommended. It's one of the best children's uh, movies out there. It's something that both uh, adults and kids can enjoy. So I encourage you to, uh, you know, find a kid or grandkid or niece or nephew or neighbor who's young and watch it with them because you'll all just delight over it. In this reimagined version of our world, toys come to life when their owners are not around, when people are not around, and they spend their time socializing and having fun. Andy, who is the new owner of Buzz, the, the toy that he was given for his birthday, uh, is a boy who has lots of other toys. And Andy's toys are this real close-knit group, led by Woody the Sheriff, um, who, who loves Andy and loves being his beloved playmate. But then Buzz comes in and, and things change a lot with the group. And the change more or less happens because, unlike all the other toys, Buzz doesn't realize that he's a toy. Um, you know, the, the dinosaur and the sheriff, they realize that, that they're just plastic and cloth, but, but Buzz Lightyear really believes he's a space ranger trying to protect the galaxy from the evil Emperor Zerg. Buzz epitomizes someone who, who tries hard to be someone that they're not. Buzz is having an identity crisis and doesn't even know it. He's so focused on being a space ranger, even though he's oblivious uh, to the fact that for, for much of the, the movie, he's just not a good one. He's, he's not able to do the things that he, think he, that he thinks he could do, that a, a space ranger would need, need to do. He, he's missing out on who he really is, Andy's toy. Haven't we all been there? Hopefully none of us have ever believed that we were a space ranger, but... Uh, but all of us have probably spent far too many hours and weeks and months and maybe even years striving and longing to be something that we were never meant to be. This, I think, is an issue that our teens struggle with in particular. Teens often wear these, these masks, uh, these identities as a mask, and, and they try on these different personas until they find the one that they like the most, whether or not it really fits them. But adults do this too. And, and if you want to know that this is accurate, all you got to do is log on to Facebook or some other social media account. And, and you'll see that uh, what people put on Facebook or Instagram are the most polished versions of themselves. It's themselves on, on summer vacation. It's, you know, the well-crafted thought or or poem, or you know, polite thanking of someone for something, uh, and and a lot of the everyday, a lot of the hard stuff that gets glossed over or 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 missed in these feeds. So why does it seem to be a part of the human condition that uh, all of us struggle with understanding and embracing who we really are? It is in this, this territory, this, uh, this uh, trying to understand our identity, that, that Jesus' text uh, intersects with our world today. You, you will hopefully remember, like I said, that we're working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and uh, at this, uh, what the Sermon on the Mount is really all about is it's Jesus teaching and training his disciples how to be... Um, how to be ministers with him, how to be his servants, how to be his followers. And he's also teaching them what the kingdom of God is like, that the kingdom that, that he came proclaiming, um, he came preaching and proclaiming the good news to, to Israel and Judea and Galilee when his ministry began. And now with these short metaphors that we, that we read already this morning, Jesus begins to teach his disciples who they are. 
If you were to survey the men and women who were seated around Jesus, their teacher that morning or that evening, whenever the, the teaching happened, uh, you would have likely received a number of responses to this question of identity. Um, some would have said Jews, you know, that they were Jews. Others would have said they were carpenters or fishermen or, or stay-at-home moms. Others uh, would say they're fathers or sisters or brothers. Uh, others, uh, sons and daughters of blank, and so on. But I can promise you the two things that no one there would have said is salt and light. But that is what Christ says they are, and we are, on that day. Now, before we, we look into what these symbols mean, I, I want to make it clear that, uh, that what we read is truly a metaphor uh, they're, they're not a parable or an allegory. There's no like one-to-one, -one, uh, Jesus said this, what he really means is that going on here. Uh, that there's some interpretation involved with this. And, and I think um, it's part of his plan that the Spirit can, uh, can work in our hearts to, uh, to help us understand what, what this is supposed to mean to each of us this morning. Um, so I, I encourage you to, to listen with an open mind and, and an open ear uh, to hear how the Spirit is speaking to you individually today. So you are the salt of the, of the earth. This is, this is what Jesus said first to his disciples. Salt is one of the most widely used uh, substances uh, on earth, and, and that was the case back then. It was a tremendously valuable and useful resource. Uh, it was a, a Swiss army knife of sorts that it just had so many purposes, so many uses at, at the time. Uh, it was obviously used to season food like how we you use it today. Uh, but the really cool thing about salt is that it's different than other seasonings. When I sprinkle pepper or, or Italian seasoning on my food, uh, I get the taste of pepper or the oregano and basil in there. But when you add salt to a dish, what, what salt does is it enhances the flavors already present. And uh, salt was also a valuable preservative. Uh, remember, this is the Bible was written back in a time when no electricity existed, no, uh, there were no refrigerators or freezers, there certainly were no big piles of snow and ice around for people to keep their food cold. Uh, so food spoiled quickly. But they learned that if you, uh, if you covered the, the food in salt, that you could preserve the food longer than it naturally would be preserved. And uh, salt was also used by Israelites during their burnt offerings. And in fact, God commanded that it would be added to every burnt offering that they gave. So in that way, salt was also a sacrifice. It, it helped make atonement. It helped make, make us right uh, before the eyes of God. Um, salt was also a mark of loyalty and, and fidelity between two parties. Um, often when a covenant or a promise was made between different people or groups, they would share a meal afterwards. And because salt was at every meal, um, the, the idea, the thought of eating salt together became this, this physical symbol of the covenant that those, those two parties just made. Salt was also a symbol of purification. I, I'm sure you didn't expect me to, to go through all this list, but there's so many. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 2, the prophet Elijah uses salt to purify a spring that had been producing bad water. And, and the salt caused it to become um, clean again and, and good to drink. So it, because of that, it became known as, as a purifying agent. And uh, salt was also associated with new beginnings. Uh, when babies were born, they often would be rubbed down with new salt, uh, with fresh salt, uh, right, right when they came out of the womb. Um, and lastly, salt was used as a fertilizer at times, which su surprised me. I didn't think it was good to add salt to soil. But apparently, in certain circumstances, they did just that, and it, and it added to the richness of the soil. Um, so as I told you, salt indeed was a very important resource that was highly useful back then, and, and it held great importance to the, the people and, and cultures. So what did Christ mean exactly when he said, you are the salt of, of the earth? 
Uh, did he mean that, that they um, bring out the best in others or that they um, keep others pure or sort of purify them? Did he mean that he can, uh, that, you know, they reconcile, they help reconcile people or, or bring others together or, or maybe that they bring new life or give second chances to people? Honestly, I'm not sure. Like I said, I think there's room in this, in this metaphor for the Spirit to speak to each of us to, you know, what he sort of is meaning for, for us or, you know, for you as an, in, an individual or us as a church. Um, but I do know that there are a couple things that Jesus intends us to, to learn from this passage, from this metaphor. Uh, first, that even though this, uh, this teaching was, uh, was being eavesdropped by, by others, it was primarily to the disciples, the people who had uh, just chosen to follow Jesus, to, um, to, to learn from him, to, uh, you know, give their lives to him. And, um, and it's this group of disciples that Jesus singles out. Uh, you don't necessarily know this, but in, in the Greek, there's an extra you here. And, and it's Jesus' way of, of drawing attention to, to who this, this um, statement is to. He's saying, you, the disciples, you are the salt. Uh, and actually, because it's a plural, it's more of a yuns. Uh, as, as they would say it around here. So uh, he's saying that this group of people, um, they are the, the ones who are the salt. It's not the crowd. It's not the Jews. It's, it's not the, the leaders. It's Jesus' disciples who are uh, the salt of the earth. Um, and, and he uses the word are. It's not that they're like salt or it's not that they're kind of salty. He's saying you are salt. Next, Jesus makes it clear that they have a purpose. They are the earth's salt, the salt of the earth. Um, and this gets at sort of one of the defining traits of salt, uh, that for it to serve its purpose, it has to be added to something else. Uh, adding salt to food enhances the food's taste or preserves it. Um, by itself, salt isn't a particularly useful thing. Uh, it's only when it's put in or on something that, that the salt is really fulfilling its purpose. So similarly, Jesus' disciples' identity is confirmed and enacted as they are sent out, as they are, are mixed into the rest of the earth. They are to be other-oriented, and, and their identity is to be anchored in that. But this teaching is not just about who they are. It's a warning if they forget who they are. Now, I didn't think it's possible, um, but salt can lose its saltiness. Uh, but this only happens when the salt is so thoroughly mixed with other things that it gets diluted um, so much that you can't notice um, its saltiness. It, it can't do what it's created to do. Uh, imagine if you were trying to season your french fries with a little tablespoon of salt but a whole cup of cinnamon. I can guarantee you uh, as you're eating those french fries and, and your mouth is coated with cinnamon, you're not going to taste any salt. All you'll taste is that burning cinnamon flavor in your mouth. Similarly, if you're trying to preserve meat with a tablespoon of salt and two pounds of dirt, that meat is not meat you're going to want to eat the next day. When salt is separated from itself and, and diluted by the things of this world, it can no longer be salt anymore. It, it must be together to serve its function, it, and it's useless otherwise. It will be discarded. And, and this doesn't mean that, you know, because again, salt is to be added to things to be used, but it's to be added to, you know, collectively, you know, it, it's a, a good amount of salt and it's not to be, um, is not to be mixed too, too much that, you know, the, the salt uh, loses what it is. Uh, so there's that really interesting balance in here of the salt needing other salt to be salty, uh, but also needing to be in something to be, to be noticed, to do what it's meant to do. Then Jesus abruptly moves into a, a parallel metaphor. He says, you are the light of the world. And in this similar metaphor, we, we see another property uh, that helps us explain what, 
what Jesus is saying about his, his followers. Light, like salt, is something that even though it's really small, it, it can make a big impact on things. And, and like salt, uh, light is sort of other-oriented as well. A, a lamp is not really valuable to just look at it. Um, a, a, a lamp, a, the, the light of the lamp is valuable because it lights up everything else. It illuminates the rest of the stuff in the room. Similarly to salt, light has a number of uses or associations that Jesus could be drawing on in this metaphor. Light is something that illuminates its surroundings. Uh, and in this way, it's often associated with truth uh, because truth is, is seen as a form of, of illumination. Light is also seen as a counterpoint to darkness, as the thing that defeats darkness. Uh, and uh, and. And in that way, it, it's, uh, it's also seen as the thing that defeats evil, which is associated with, with darkness. Um, and light is also used as a direct uh, synonym for Christ, that Christ says, I am the light. Uh, light brought peace and safety um, and security as well. People would, would light their lamps at night when they're going to bed, in part to keep them from stumbling through their house in, in the dark and potentially hurting themselves, but also to um, ward off potential burglars who would want to take advantage of a completely dark home. But Jesus expands this metaphor by pointing out the noticeability of light. People notice when a light is suddenly present. If you want to know this for sure, all you have to do is wait until a member of your family is soundly sleeping at night and then turn on the lights in the room. And I can almost promise you they will wake up with a less than happy greeting. Um, but they will certainly notice the light. The, the presence of, of, of light, particularly in the place of, of deep darkness, is very noticeable. Even, even when the light is small, even when it's just a candle. In this line of thought, Jesus tells them that a city on a hill cannot be hidden. By this, I think he's, he's talking about a, a nighttime journey from someone. Uh, that, you know, walking through the Judean countryside, the Palestinian countryside, was a very dangerous thing at night. There were often bandits waiting to uh, ambush people. So to see a city, to see the lights of a city up ahead of you would bring hope to people, to know that they're close to safety. And to, to drive home... Um, or, sorry, Jesus is pointing out the fact that, that light is meant to be seen. Candles, lamps, torches, they are, they're meant to light up the world. And to drive this fact home, he, he throws out this laughable scenario of, of lighting a lamp or a candle and then covering it up with a bowl or, or a basket. And this not only would be foolish, but in many cases it would be dangerous. As he points out, lamps are are truly made to be put on a lampstand because a, a lampstand would, would elevate the light up to a place that it could shine the most amount of light uh, throughout the house. It, it could illuminate the house as much as possible. And uh, this was especially important because it was just small clay lamps um, that, uh, that was their light sources at, at night. They, they ran on olive oil. They didn't produce a lot of light. And uh, and it's not like people had uh, dozens of these lamps around their house. Most people probably only had one, two, three, four lights trying to light up all of their house. Uh, so they had to maximize their, their light. They had to make the most use of their light. Jesus is uh, then explaining this metaphor by saying, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. See, light is meant to shine, to light up the world. And Jesus commands them to shine their light in the world so that people could see God's work in them. They could see God's light shining out of them and, and praise God for that. Christ lit their lamp and they are now carrying this light with them out into the world. Again, we see this metaphor as this really strong um, example of, of other-orientedness orient, uh, in that light 
in that, um, you know, with, with this light, it, it's lighting up, it's meant to light up others, it's meant to light up the world. And, and this is what Jesus is trying to hit home. It's not really light unless it's illuminating something. Friends, these metaphors are, are, are truly about identity, but, but they're also about commissioning. Christ is telling them who they are and what, um, is telling them that who they are and what they're meant to do is connected. That their doing stems for their being, and their being um, inspires their doing. Jesus made it quite clear for, for his followers, being light and salt was not optional. It was who they are. They are to be the, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. As salt, some of us are called to bring um, out the, the beautiful taste in the world. And, and some of us are called to be um, purifiers. And some will, will help renew this world. And, and some will bear witness to a covenant between God and humans. As light, some of us will, will light up the deep darkness in this world, and some will illuminate truth where there's lies, and some will bring safety and security and warmth, and so on. All of us, all who follow Jesus, are salt and light. All of us have a purpose from God for how we were meant to bless this world. Friends, we cannot deny who we are, but we can try to hide the light to diminish, uh, to diminish our saltiness. And our efforts to fit in or, or to become one with this world, uh, we can lose our way and, and forget who we are. Our, our salt can be just one speck of the other elements that's uh, in this meaningless mass. Or, or we can try to squelch our light by, by hiding it, uh, its beams under a bowl or a basket. I think it's because of this that Jesus chose to address his disciples as a collective. It is when the church, the, the yuns of this passage, come together that we are truly salt, that the light of our mutual lamps truly light up the world. The followers of Christ were meant to sort of re-season each other and to reignite the fires of Christ in our hearts so that when we go out into the world, we're not swallowed up by it or or um, buried beneath it. Without each other, we begin to lose who we are, and, and our light becomes, becomes hidden and our salt diluted. We need each other to, to shine brightly. And we, we see this in the movie The Toy Story as well. Midway through the movie, Buzz's eyes are finally opened, and, and he comes to the hard and, and painful realization that there is no star command. There is no evil Emperor Zerg, and even his own spaceship is just pretend. And all he ever was and all he ever will be is a toy. He was devastated by this. But then Woody the Sheriff comes to his rescue by, by helping him to see that not only is he a cool toy, but he is Andy's toy, and he is loved by that little boy. In that moment, thanks to Woody's care for him, Buzz accepts and embraces himself for who he truly is. And as he does, he and Woody form this unbreakable bond, as strong as brothers, and, and they have countless adventures um, in all of these subsequent movies together. As these toys uh, embrace who they really were, they together were able to shine in a way that they couldn't just on their own. So I ask, in what way has the Spirit been reminding you today how you were meant to shine? Where has God been pointing out to you that uh, there is some lack of salt in the world, that they could really use some of your saltiness? Mr. Way has always been an example in my life of someone who was salty, someone who shined brightly. I had him for, um, as my physics professor back in, in ninth grade. And he was, without a doubt, one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, he got a degree from MIT, was on his way to become a, a, a rocket scientist when he felt God calling him to change his career and, and to become a, a teacher for high schoolers. So he left behind that much more profitable world, a much more intellectually stimulating world, 
uh, for a life of teaching in Lancaster. As he did, he, he found his place in the world. Uh, this was his lampstand that God had sent up, had set up for, for him to, to shine, for him to shine his most, uh, the most amount of his light. My ninth grade year, um, in, in my ninth grade year, one of my classmates who was uh, beloved and, and highly respected died unexpectedly. Um, and the next day in class, after the news had broken to our school, instead of continuing to work our way through the science that he was teaching us, Mr. Way took us out of the school. He took us, uh, we, we walked across the street to a, a local church in their cemetery there. And as a class, we had a discussion on life and death, on grief and love. Mr. Way uh, couldn't legally witness to us as we were in public school and he was our teacher. Um, but it didn't matter because in that moment, the love of God shone so brightly to us. And this wasn't just a momentary flicker of his flame. It was a reflection of how he always was. Uh, he, he helped out anyone who, who needed help with their math homework. Um, he was always there to greet people uh, in between classes and at the beginning and end of school. Um, he, he led a Bible study for uh, whoever wanted to come over to his house once a week. And there were dozens of people who joined him and his wife for, um, for a, a time in God's word. I think it was on Wednesday nights. And, and in so many ways, he let his light shine into our school. And it made a huge difference in, in my life and in, in the life of my peers. And... Uh, Mr. Way, sadly, is, is gone now. He, he passed away unexpectedly a couple years after I graduated high school. But, but the light that he's shown into this world continues to live on in my heart and, and in the hearts of the people that, um, that he touched, that he affected. Friends, like Mr. Way, each of us is salt. Each of us is light. As Eugene Boring, a, a, a Christian theologian, puts it, Christ's message to us all through this passage is simple. Be what you are. Be salty. Be bright. Make your presence known in this world, not because you are special, but because the God who made you and who ignited your heart is. Amen. So now, friends, as we... Um, as we continue in worship, I invite you to respond to this love from God, this call from God, uh, by singing our next hymn, Called as Partners in Christ's Service.
Friends, let us say together uh, this summary of how God calls us to be salt and light in the world using a portion of, of a brief statement of faith. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Friends, our, our offering time uh, is a time of gratitude where we make space to give back to God out of thanks for uh, all of the, the many ways that God has blessed us and provided for us. Uh, and so we give these offerings and, of thanks and, and tithes and commitments to, to God at this time. And, and let, us, uh, make, uh, let us make these offerings today to the Lord. So let's pray. Gracious and loving God, recognizing that all gifts are from your hands, we thank you for the many good things in our lives. This Father's Day, we thank you for the fathers in our lives, both real biological fathers or honorary fathers, men who cared for us, taught us, provided for us, loved us, guided, guided us, laughed with us, and who forgave us when we messed up and picked us up when we fell and, and so many other things. For these men in our lives who, who tried to faithfully love us, we, we give you many heartfelt thanks. In gratitude for this and for, for all other things that we've received, we return to you these offerings of thanks. We pray that as we give, that it would help us to learn to put our trust in you more and, 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 uh, and learn to trust you as the true source of our provision. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to pray again and, and to this time lift up our concerns to the Lord, I want to remind you uh, some different things that we can be praying about together. Um, let us remember that uh, even though many of us are celebrating today, celebrating our fathers or our fatherhood, that today is a painful day for some. So let us remember those who have a painful relationship or in, with their father or in some way um, have difficulties on Father's Day. And let us remember... In prayer, our, our center church family who are listed in the bulletin under ongoing prayer concerns. And uh, let us remember as well to pray for the corners of our nation and world that's experiencing extreme weather right now. Um, and, and just a reminder, if there's other things that you would like us to pray about, you can always uh, send me an email or send an email to the prayer chain about your, your concern. And, and uh, that way your, um, your, your prayers, your concerns can be heard from the wider congregation. So let us go to the Lord in prayer again. There is no part of our life that you do not touch, O oh God. Infusing your, your rich fragrance, gritty and real, getting in underneath the surface, drawing out and lifting up your winding love around us until our defenses are lower, lowered, barriers broken down, and the power of your love reveals the beauty you intended for each of your children. May your actions draw attention to you, to the richness you bring to all life, and the abundance you share, setting the scene for us to share too. As we remember all the ways that you have cared for and provided for this world, we, we silently lift up to you our prayers for the many things that trouble our heart today. Help us to bring light into all the darkness of life, spreading hope for a better world, a world where justice is made real by your children living together in harmony. Help us to bring salt into the blandness of life, encouraging vitality and joy in living in a world that dares to hope for the future that, and you promise where all your children will know themselves to be loved, valued, and treasured, created in your image, and bringing you glory forever. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, we are uh, to our last hymn now, so I invite you to join us in singing, Arise, Your Light is Come. Friends, when you go from here, remember to be what you are, and in that way bring glory to the, to the God who made you and loves you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Go in peace.